All right, welcome everybody. Um, so this is the Water for the Garden and Orchard class. I am Dean Gunderson. I'm the Director of Education for Seed St. Louis. Uh, if you don't know who Seed St. Louis is, uh, we used to be called Gateway Greening for a long time. We just changed our name last fall. Um, but we work with communities who want to grow their own food. Um, and we're located here in St. Louis. So we work directly in the St. Louis region, but our classes and online stuff is obviously open to anybody uh, anywhere in the world. We get attendees on these classes from all over the world, which is exciting. So hopefully if you are from another part of the world, this is also helpful to you. Um, a lot of it's pretty transferable, but <clears throat> first, um, a lot of this seems pretty obvious, but just the significance of water. Um, we're gonna talk today about um, kind of some of the techniques to reduce, reduce how much water you need to use, um, kind of some options of irrigating, um, so adding water to your soil. Um, but I always like to kind of start out with why, why are we talking about this um, when I teach a class? So just the significance of water. Um, water is the most important thing that plants get from the soil. Uh, you know, oftentimes uh, we talk about like, oh, you need to add fertilizer, you need to get, you know, nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium. And those things are important, but if there's no water, it doesn't matter. You can put all the fertilizer in the world. If there's not enough water, that fertilizer is not going to make that plant grow any faster. Water is the most critical thing that a plant gets from the soil. And irrigated crops, so things that you're adding water to artificially, not just um, relying on rain, um, like, on a, like on a farming scale, irrigated crop yields are higher than non-irrigated crops virtually across the board. I mean, there's really nowhere in the world, at least from like studies and stuff that I've seen, where irrigating crops doesn't improve the yield because you're making sure that those plants are getting as much water as they possibly need to grow as quickly, as vigorously, as healthy um, as possible. So, you know, managing water can be really critical for that. Um, in terms of what the plant actually does with that water, water is used to give structure to non-woody plant material. So, you know, like wood, um, you know, is, is a rigid structure. So like trees and stuff like that. Um, but the, the non-woody part of trees like leaves or, you know, our vegetables that are not woody, um, that are all herbaceous, we call them, the, you know, what, what like holds them upright is actually the, the pressure from the water in their cells. And that's why when plants um, don't have water for a long time, they wilt. It's because they, that pressure drops because they don't have enough water and they literally start drooping um, because they lose, they lose that structure because the water, water is actually vital to plants actually holding that structure. Water is also used to move nutrients up into plant tissue. So again, this kind of goes back to, you know, you can add nitrogen, phosphorus or potassium or, you know, any other fertilizer, but if there's not enough water, the plant can't even really absorb them because it's, it's the movement of water um, kind of out of the leaf, kind of evaporating out of the leaf. And then that kind of pressure differential that pulls more water up from the soil up the stem, it's, it's in that water oftentimes that those, that many of the nutrients are kind of traveling up um, through that. And also water is the source of hydrogen uh, that fuels photosynthesis. So, you know, what plants are making during um, photosynthesis is, is, is carbohydrates, which is like carbon and hydrogen, like bonded together in various forms. And so the carbon comes from the air, from CO2, um, but the hydrogen is coming from water. So again, like if there's not enough water, the plant can't even photosynthesize. So like water is, is really critical to, to almost everything a plant does, just in the way that it's really critical, you know, to humans and other animals and, and everything else. You know, water is just, it's real important. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, you know, you should just add lots of water all the time. Too much is also bad. Um, just because water is vital doesn't mean more is always going to be better. Um, as is usually the case in life, you need just enough, not too little, not too much. Um, and, and excluding a few notable exceptions like rice or water chestnuts, um, nothing that is grown for food, like none of your vegetables, none of your fruit trees, want saturated soil at any time. Um, rice and water chestnuts will also even grow in unsaturated soils. They will just tolerate saturated soils, but your vegetables, your fruit trees, things like that, they will not tolerate saturated soils. There's, there's kind of a, a, a um, kind of spectrum of how much they can tolerate. You know, some things it's like if they're saturated for a day, 
they're on their way to death. And there's other things that, you know, the soil can be saturated and pretty wet for a couple days or even a week or more. Um, but long term, if that soil is like wet and soggy for a long time, the plant's going to die um, because there also needs to be oxygen in the soil and there needs to be, you know, lots of different things. So unless it's like a wetland plant that has a way to get those other things needed when the soil is saturated, they're not, they're not going to make it. And so again, so irrigation is kind of an adding water, managing water is really kind of a delicate dance, delicate dance of, you know, how do I get enough water to my plants without giving them too much? <clears throat> so then kind of the question will often come of, you know, when to water things that like, how do you know when to do that? You know, like, how do I know that I'm not going to overwater them? Or how do I know to give them enough water? And unfortunately, I don't have a good formula for you because life is not a formula. Um, so when to water vegetables, the very unhelpful answer I'm going to give you is when the soil is dry. Um, so, you know, when it's needed. But, um, but what that kind of looks like is, you know, if you have newly planted seeds, so, you know, if you're planting seeds, just like, you know, this person here on the left, um, you know, if you think about it, if that, you know, if that seed's only this deep in the soil, if it's dry in all of this soil, even if it's wet down here, that seed is never going to germinate because that seed needs moisture. So if you've just like just planted seeds, that, that soil should pretty much be wet kind of right at the surface in, until they're, until they germinate, until they kind of pop up out of the soil. So if you've just seeded things, you're going to need to be watering pretty regularly um, to make sure that that seed is staying moist so that it will, it will germinate and kind of come, come out of the soil, come forth and start and start growing. Um, and kind of the smaller the seed, the more, you know, the more regularly it needs to be watered. You know, if the seed's like a poppy seed and it's just kind of like sitting on the surface, uh, that soil is going to need to be kept um, pretty consistently moist right there at the surface. Versus if you're planting, you know, a bigger seed like a bean like this that you might be planting an inch deep, then as long as the soil is wet an inch deep, then, then it's going to germinate. Um, and you know you don't need to water all that often unless it's really hot to keep the soil moist an inch deep. So it really kind of depends on what you're planting. But if you're if you have seeds that are not you know yet plants, then you need to be watering as often as is needed to keep the soil where that seed is moist until that germination happens. Um, once you have a, an actual plant growing um, and not just a seed. Uh, they, sh the, they should be watered really anytime the soil between kind of one to two inches deep is dry, if you're talking about vegetables. Um, so that's, you know, not, you know, that's a, a decent depth, really. Um, kind of one of the, the things that people can often tell you is if you stick your finger in kind of up to this, not this first knuckle, but this second one, kind of this middle knuckle here. So, you know, about that far, if you kind of stick that into your garden soil, and if it feels wet, if it feels moist in the soil, um, then you're good. You don't need to water yet. If it, if you stick it in, you know, up to that second knuckle and the soil feels dry, it's time to water. And so that, that kind of gives you an idea of what, of what you do and that, and that depth. So, you know, not just like water it all day, every day so that it's wet right at the soil um, surface helps to make sure that the soil isn't going to be saturated, which again, we don't want because we don't want those roots sitting in wet, soggy soil all the time. But what it also helps to do is by allowing that top surface to dry out periodically, um, but making sure that you know, you know, down here is wet all the time. What you're then encouraging that plant to do is to invest its energy in growing roots down here, which means that you know, if it takes a week to dry out this you know top inch, two inches or whatever, if the roots are down here, then as long as it rains once a week, which it normally does then you might not have to water at all. It kind of just encourages plants to grow their roots um, deeper versus if you're watering every morning and every night or even more often, I know some people that are watering like three times a day, um, then the roots are gonna grow just right at the surface because that's where the moisture is coming. And that's where kind of the most reliable water is. Uh, and what that means is that you have to continue to water that often all growing season. Otherwise that plant's gonna struggle because those roots are, are dependent on that frequent water. So, um, so you can water more often, like, and I mean, that, that's not a problem necessarily, but, um, but kind of those more frequent shallow waterings are gonna encourage surface root growth 
versus a less frequent kind of deeper watering is going to encourage the roots to go deeper, which is going to give you more robust plants, especially as we move into the hotter, um, drier part of the year. And is also much nicer if you want to like go on vacation or not be at your garden every single day. Uh, it's very nice to have nice deep roots on your plants. So then if we're talking about, uh, or and then timing, sorry, I didn't put a, a thing on here. But another thing that people will ask about a lot is like what time to water. Um, and what I always say is water whenever you can. I mean, if this is like an ideal situation and you can pick whenever you're gonna water. Um, I mean, I think the best time to water the vegetable garden is in the early morning um, because it's not gonna be overly hot. So you're gonna, it's gonna allow some time for the, for the water to get into the soil. Um, it's not going to be as much of a shock to the plant because the water temperature that you're watering is going to be about the same or closer to the air temperature than if you're doing it in the really hot part middle of the day. Um, but what it also does by doing it in the morning instead of doing it in the evening is because you're going into the sunny and hot part of the day, it's also going to give plenty of time for any moisture that's on the leaves. Like if you're spraying the plants, it's going to give plenty of time for that moisture on the leaves to dry, which is going to help reduce issues um, with fungal diseases versus if you, you know, water them in the evening and then those leaves stay wet kind of all night, that's a perfect situation to get fungus growing, to get molds, mildews, things like that growing on your plants. But if it's, you know, if it needs to be watered and it's really hot and dry and your plants are stressed and the only time you can do it in the evening, do it in the evening. Like do it when you need to do it to get the job done. But you know, the perfect time, in my opinion, is kind of early morning, but okay. So then orchards. Um, so watering kind of your fruit trees, fruiting shrubs, nut trees, you know, vines, cane fruit, all those different things are a little different, um, but they are the same in the sense of you water it when needed. Um, but generally speaking, what that's gonna look like is the first year that you plant um, your orchard plant, um, whether that's a tree, shrub, vine, whatever it is, um, that's a perennial. Um, I say you need to water um, once per week that does not have significant rain. So if we have, you know, a real rainy week in the spring, you don't need to be out there watering them that week. But if we have a week, a week where it doesn't really rain, um, or the only rain we got was some like real intense heavy rain that happened in like 20 minutes and so most of the water just ran off, you still need to water during those times. And you want to do it once a week and you want to do a nice, deep, slow watering once a week. And again, that's to help um, get that water deep down into the soil, which is going to help encourage those roots to grow nice and deep for you. So kind of the number that I give is about five gallons of water per tree or shrub per week. Um, so you can, you can get that five gallons in many different ways, which we'll talk about the different ways to, to irrigate later. Um, but if you're just thinking about like a garden hose, one of the easiest ways is if you get your hose, you get a five gallon bucket, you get a timer, you know, like on your phone or something, and you just start the hose and you just time how long does it take to fill up this five gallon bucket. And then you just go to the tree and you know, if it's like 30 seconds then you go to the tree and you sit there and you count one, two, three, you know, up to 30 then you move to the next tree and you just do that with all your different trees. Um, there are some other ways that are a little more automated that I, that I like that we'll talk about. Um, but that's probably the easiest way if you've just got, you know, one or two trees that you're doing. Um, after establishment. So usually that would be, you know, after, after year one. Um, but you know, if you had problems or you had to move the tree or it's stressed or, you know, something weird, you know, if it's still not looking great um, after the first year, then maybe you'll want to keep that once a week watering after that first year. But for the most part, after that first year, you don't really need to do regular watering on your, your orchard plants really at all. Um, after that first year, watering is rarely needed unless there's a prolonged drought. You know, if we have a time in July where it's 95 degrees and it hasn't rained in three weeks, yeah, water, go water your trees. Like they're gonna, they're gonna appreciate it. But, um, but for the most part, um, you know, under kind of regular conditions, they're not gonna need any, any consistent regular watering once they get established. That being said, cane fruits, so things like blackberries and raspberries, um, they, they will still grow without regular irrigation. They will be fine, but they do respond very well to continued irrigation past the first year. 
Um, and what I mean by that is you are going to see pretty significant yield increases um, if you give them that extra water, especially during those hotter parts of summer when they're ripening fruit and it might not be raining as much. Um, fruit is mostly water. And so, you know, if you've got blackberries ripening in July and it's hot and dry and you water them, you're going to get bigger, juicier berries on blackberries and raspberries in particular. Um, that's also the case for things like peaches. Um, but the trick with peaches is, is if you water them a lot, you will get bigger peaches, but they won't be any sweeter. They'll just be juicier. So they actually end up kind of being less sweet. But if you do just want a nice, big, juicy peach, um, then watering them, you, you will get larger peaches. Um, but I think the flavor of ones that haven't been irrigated taste a little better. They're a little more dense, a little sweeter, um, which is my preference, but that's up to you. But in terms of like the peach will not die or anything if it doesn't get watered on a regular basis, unless again, there's a prolonged drought. And in terms of time of day for, for trees, doesn't really matter at all um, because you're not going to be spraying the top of the tree at all. I hope you shouldn't be doing that. If you're just spraying the ground, doesn't really matter when you do that. <clears throat> so one of the first things in terms of managing your water, um, you know, I, especially if we're talking about sustainability, you know, the best um, investment in sustainability of water is not having to use it. Uh, and so there are ways to kind of reduce the need for irrigation um, or kind of reduce the frequency that you might need to be adding water to a plant. Um, one of the best way, and yeah, that's what it says right here, is to use less, make irrigation less necessary. Um, and the way to do that is uh, there's, there's two main ways. One is to improve your soil's water holding capacity. So different soils can hold different amounts of water. So, you know, a very sandy soil, which we don't really have around St. Louis, but a very sandy soil is not really gonna hold much water versus like a clay soil is gonna hold a lot of water. Um, soils that have lots of compost are gonna hold lots of water. So, you know, kind of improving the water holding capacity of your soil in a way that isn't gonna be bad for your trees. So, you know, just adding a bunch of clay to your soil is not something that I would ever recommend, um, but there are, ways that are help, helpful for your plants that will improve water holding capacity. And the other one is to reduce moisture loss from the soil. So reduce evaporation from the soil so that the water that's in the soil is instead of just being lost to the air is gonna be saved in that soil so that your plant can use it as needed. <clears throat> so um, the first way to improve um, your wa the water holding capacity, like the main way and the way that I would recommend is to add organic matter. So organic matter is dead, dead things basically. So, um, so dead plant material, um, dead animals too, but mostly we're not composting animals. Um, but dead plant material is organic matter. And just as an illustration of how helpful organic matter is, there's been some studies on farms where they've found that each percent increase in organic matter in the soil. So what that means is, you know, if you take soil and you like dry it and you break it up into its individual components and you measure out, you know, how much of this is organic matter. If it's 1% organic matter, and then you take another soil that's 2% organic matter. So that 1% kind of increase of organic matter in the soil can increase the water holding capacity of an acre of, of land um, within the top foot of soil. You know, you can't measure all the way down, but like in the top foot of soil, an acre by 16,500 gallons. So that soil can hold without losing it to runoff, um, without you know, dropping it all the way down to the ground the groundwater, but just hold in the structure of the soil, 16,500 more gallons of water sitting there ready for the plant to use um, for each percent increase in organic matter. And so if you're thinking about like a raised bed, like a four by 10 raised bed, that's the equivalent of 15 more gallons of water that you can hold in a raised bed. If I did the math right, I think I did. So then how do you increase organic matter? And the answer to that, especially on a gardening scale is compost for the most part. It is by far the cheapest, easiest, fastest way to increase um, organic matter significantly in your garden soil. So most people that are in like a raised bed already have quite a bit of compost in their soil, because hopefully the soil you bought to fill your raised bed had lots of compost in it, uh, but it's always good to add more to kind of refresh that organic matter. Um, but if, if you're in the ground though, like if you're just like tilling up an area um, of your backyard or you're planting fruit trees into soil in your backyard, 
uh, the organic matter is probably pretty low. Most of our kind of urban soils are like one to 3% organic matter, um, which is really crazy low. Um, and so what I would recommend for a garden in particular would be to add a few inches of compost to the soil surface of your garden. And then if you, if you want to till, you can till it in, or you can usually just leave it on top, or you can kind of break it up and kind of mix it in roughly with like a shovel or a digging fork or a broad fork or something like that. Uh, another way that is slower, but, but I do also like for other reasons, uh, to add organic matter to your soil is, um, is mulch. So for any orchard plants, I highly recommend wood chips um, on the soil surface. They are kind of a really long lasting mulch. Um, they add fungus to, or they, they encourage fungal growth in the soil, um, which trees really, really like um, fungally dominated soil. So it can also help um, in that way. For your vegetable garden, I would not recommend wood chips. Um, like there's like, it's not gonna bother the plants at all, but they're, um, they're very difficult to work with in a vegetable garden. Um, I know some people who do it, but I just personally do not like wood chips at all in a vegetable garden. Um, what I like for vegetable gardens is herbaceous plant material. So that would be things like, so, so non-woody dead plants. So things like straw or um, leaves like that you raked up from your yard in the fall, or even like paper, newspaper, um, moss, you know, just kind of like kind of any dead weeds or one of my favorite. Um, I weed or I like weed eat an area and then rake up all the grass and then use that um, after it's kind of dried out. Like you don't want wet matted stuff. Uh, but any of that is good mulch around um, around kind of your your vegetable garden area. Uh, and over time, as those break down, they're going to add that organic matter into your soil. <clears throat> um, another way to increase um, organic matter in your soil is um, cover crops. So cover crops, uh, which we have some other classes that we go into the specifics of cover crops. Um, but if you're in the garden, uh, winter cover crops are a phenomenal way to add organic matter to your soil. So those are cover crops that you plant in the late fall, and then they grow all winter long, and then they grow during the spring, and then you kill them kind of just in time to be planting summer crops. So if you have a garden where you're mostly growing warm season things like tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, sweet potatoes, things like that, um, winter cover crops are a really, really great way um, to reduce weed pressure and also to add organic matter to your soil, which helps improve the water holding capacity. It means you don't need to be watering your tomatoes and stuff as often. Um, if you grow cool season things, like if you have, you know, lots of things that you're growing in the spring and lots of things that you're growing in the fall, you can also do a warm season cover crop kind of in between the, the spring and the fall crops. Um, things like buckwheat do really well in there. There's a couple millets like Japanese millet that will also do okay <clears throat> in that kind of couple month window in the middle of summer when you're not growing those cool season crops. For uh, the orchard, uh, planting things that produce a lot of biomass um, but don't negatively impact tree growth can work um, as a way to increase organic matter. So, um, so this would be, um, sorry. Um, so this would be a, um, you know, a plant that is basically not a grass. Gra trees don't like grass, um, especially rhizomatous grass. So things like Bermuda grass or things that, you know, spread underground. Um, they don't like those grasses at all. They're very competitive um, with trees, shrubs, vines. But really any kind of broadleaf plant um, is usually an okay thing to grow. Um, but there's some things that do better than others. And I've got a list in here um, where I'll talk about those. So uh, cover crops for the orchard, kind of things that I like to plant around my trees. And this is a picture here of an apple tree where you can see um, to keep the grass kind of at bay, we planted these, um, these other plants around here, which helped, which is gonna help add organic matter to the soil. It's also gonna help control weeds, grassy weeds, which is nice. Um, and some of my favorites, you can see there's a, a long list here. Things like mint, this is a great place to grow mint. Um, especially if you're like mowing around it because then the mint's not going to go anywhere. You're mowing it, so you're controlling it. Doesn't hurt the tree at all. Um, they take shade just fine. But mint, strawberries, thyme, oregano, sage, um, horseradish, um, comfrey is really one of the only non-edible ones that I like to grow. Um, and that's what this big leafy thing is here. 
Uh, it just, it grows really fast and it produces lots of leafy stuff that you can cut two or three times a year and just lay down kind of as mulch around your plants, which is gonna be adding lots of organic matter. Um, chives and garlic chives um, are also good around your trees. Daylilies um, are, are edible, um, believe it or not, which we can talk about later if you're interested, but they are edible, um, as are hostas, they're also edible. Um, Mitsuba is an edible um, kind of herb uh, that grows well under trees. Um, it has kind of like a parsley flavor. And then sorrel will also do pretty well. And that's another kind of perennial leafy green. Another really good way to reduce irrigation needs, especially in your vegetable garden, is, is mulch. Um, so mulch not only is going to be adding organic matter to your soil as it decomposes, but by covering the soil, um, it's, it protects that bare soil from direct sun um, and wind. So as the wind blows across the soil, it's going to dry it out. When you have the mulch on top, it's going to act as like a little insulation layer to keep that wind away and to keep the moisture kind of trapped. And it's also gonna keep the temperature of the soil lower and prevent the sun again from hitting it directly and kind of insulate it. And by keeping the temperature of the soil lower, it's gonna reduce how much moisture is being evaporated off of the soil surface and lost to, um, to the atmosphere as humidity. Um, <clears throat> and and a, a good way to kind of, kind of see how much uh, mulch can help with this is, you know, if you think, you know, if you, if you go in the summer, relatively hot, um, dry, and you go to like a lawn where there's, you know, kind of bare patches in the lawn and you look and the ground can be hard as a rock. And then you go somewhere like under a tree and there's like kind of leaves laying on and you kind of scratch it up. It's wet under there. Even if the area out in the sun, you know, bare soil is hard as a rock, dry, you know, like dust just been baked by the sun. You go under a, under a tree where there's leaves or, or something laying on the soil. You go into a forest and you kind of pull back the leaves. It's wet, even if it hasn't rained in weeks sometimes. So it can, mulch can really, really help. Um, and again, just as a, um, as a reminder, um, wood chips is what we recommend for orchard plants and then herbaceous plant matter like straw, grass clippings, leaves, um, weeds, or even paper um, is what I would recommend for vegetables. So then, uh, you know, assuming you, you know, conserved um, your moisture, you did mulch, you know, you added organic matter, um, but you still need to add water sometimes. Um, one way to do that, that is, um, you know, a little bit more sustainable and doesn't cost um, money, like the, the water itself doesn't cost money, is to catch um, rainwater. So um, a couple things to know if you're going to collect rainwater, especially if you're going to collect it off your roof, that's what most people want to do, is they want to collect it off their roof, is um, you want to know what your roof is made of. Um, if it is asphalt, like if it's a flat roof that's got, you know, the asphalt kind of like poured over the top, or it's asphalt shingles, um, you want to know that because there can be contam contamination concerns, especially for vegetables. It's not as big of a concern for um for fruiting like trees and shrubs, just because of the way that, um, that contaminants kind of move in plants. They, it usually doesn't concentrate in fruits, but especially if you're thinking about like, oh, I'm gonna be watering my lettuce or something, you're like potentially putting those contaminants literally onto the plant and contaminants do tend to concentrate in the leaves. So if you have things like asphalt or asphalt shingles, um, you just wanna be aware about, of that, maybe do a little research, do a little cost benefit analysis, um, cause they're, um, because there can be some contaminants in, in asphalt um, that might not, be, might not be a great idea. But if you have a different type of roof, if it's you know, slate or, I don't know, tile or metal or, um, or wood or something like, you know, like, like wood kind of shingles or something like that, those are all for the most part fine um, to use. You um, are also gonna need an accessible downspout in order to you know, collect and divert the water that is coming down off your roof into some sort of storage to use to have the water. Um, and I also like to point out, you know, you'll, you'll see a lot of times where people will have, you know, you know, like a full size American house, you know, like 2000 square foot or, you know, whatever. I think the average home now is like 2,500 square feet or something like new construction. Um, and they'll be like, I'm going to put a 55 gallon barrel at the corner of my roof. And that's great. But if you do the math, uh, no, sorry. There's a typo there. It's supposed to be a thousand square foot roof, which again is much smaller than the average roof in the US, but a 1000 square foot roof 
will shed 623 gallons of water during a one inch rainstorm. So that 55 gallon drum ain't gonna do much. I mean, you're gonna have lots of overflowing water, lots of water pooling by your foundation. It's like the whole thing. So you just wanna know, I mean, that if you're, if you're thinking about collecting water in a container, you wanna know, you know how much of your roof is gonna be moving in that direction kind of figure out roughly how much water that's going to be. Um, and a calculation for that is, you know, if you think like one square foot, you know, 12 inches by 12 inches is, um, you know, 144 square inches. If you think like we get an inch of rain, that's like 144 cubic inches. Um, one gallon is 231 cubic inches. So like a foot and a half square foot-ish, um, like one and a half square feet is going to give you about a gallon of water in a one inch rain event. So, you know, calculate that up by like kind of how much of your roof area, the, the gutter it's collecting from that you're, you know, want to attach a down, like a, a barrel to a downspout or something like that, and just get a reasonable amount of storage for that. Um, or you can get just a very significant overflow, which we'll talk about. So if you're wanting to collect water, you're going to need a couple things. You're going to need a container where the water can get in, but mosquitoes cannot. So, you know, a barrel like this is kind of one of the most common things that people will see. So you need some sort of hole in the top where your downspout can go in so that the water can, you know, pour from the downspout into that barrel or whatever container it is you're using. But if you just have an open area and, you know, the downspout isn't covering that whole area and you've got standing water in that barrel, mosquitoes are going to get in. So you do want to do something to make sure that mosquitoes cannot get into that water. Otherwise, you're going to just create a mosquito breeding ground in your garden, which I imagine you don't want. Um, a really easy way to deal with that is if you just get some window screening and you kind of put it around or like over that opening. You can either literally put it just directly on, the, like cover the whole opening with screen and then have the downspout just pour into the screen itself is usually an easy way to do that because um, then you don't need to worry about like working around the downspout or anything. But if you put that screen straight over, um, it's gonna allow the water to go through the screen. It's also gonna act as a little bit of a, of, a, of a filter. Like if leaves or something are coming down, it's gonna hit that screen and not go into your barrel. And then as more water comes down, it's gonna eventually wash those off. Um, so it also helps act um, in that way, but you don't wanna have big openings so that mosquitoes can get in and breed in your rain barrel. You're also gonna need a way to remove water from that barrel. So the most, the most um, popular way to do that is some sort of spigot at the bottom of the barrel. Um, you could also just have like a way to take the top off and just like scoop water out. I've got a rain barrel that I do that with sometimes um, that I just use like a watering can and I just like scoop it up. Um, but uh, a spigot is usually the most common way that people will attach um, to the bottom. If you're gonna do a spigot at the bottom, it is really important. A lot of times people don't think about this, um, but it's important to elevate the rain barrel enough so that you can get to the spigot. If the spigot's at the very bottom and you set the rain barrel on the ground, um, it's, it's pretty hard to get to that spigot if you're trying to like fill up a watering can or something. And also like over time, that barrel tends to sink a little bit. And sometimes you can get it where the spigot, you just can't get to it at all. So you're gonna wanna put it on like a stand or even just like some cinder blocks or something so that it's up off the ground so that you can easily get to that spigot and attach a hose or get a watering can underneath it or whatever you're gonna use um, to distribute the water from that barrel. Um, a, a, something that I do like to mention though, is, you know, a lot of times people will be like, oh, I'm going to put it on a three foot stand so that I get lots of pressure. I'm just going to burst your bubble. Now you cannot get the rain barrel high enough, like literally high enough to get enough water pressure to run a hose. Like if you're wanting to run like a hose nozzle, you know, like a hose from the spigot, you're like, oh, I'll raise my rain barrel three feet. That ain't going to do it. Um, to get the pressure that you're getting from the city water. It needs to be as high as a water tower. That's that's why water towers are as high as they are. That's the height needed to get enough drop to create that much pressure. Um, so unless you're going to get like a pump, which you can do, there's pumps that you can get to pressurize the water and push it out. You're not going to be able to be running, you know, a nice, you know, forceful hose from that rain barrel. It's just not going to happen. Um, there, but I'll we'll talk about ways that you can distribute the water. Um, and you are gonna need an overflow. So in this picture, that's what this um, pipe is here. So as the water comes in um, this area that he's drilling on here, 
fills up when the water level gets almost to the top any more that comes in is just going to pour out this hose and then you want to make sure that that overflow is going somewhere that it's going to be moving in a way that is not going to be destructive to your home or to your yard so you know either back wherever the downspout was going before or you know out into your yard somewhere that it's not going to cause a problem <clears throat> so uh in terms of you know what are you going to use for a rain barrel uh, there's a lot of options. There's a lot of pre-made rain barrels like you can just go buy at the store. Um, that those are nice, especially if you just want a smaller one and you want it to look nice. They tend to look prettier than homemade ones, um, but they are um, they are kind of pricey. You can also do IBC totes. Um, oh, and I had a picture and I guess it didn't save on here. Um, so you can get IBC totes, which are those big white plastic kind of cubes. They hold like 275 gallons. Um, they're usually not real cheap, um, but for the amount of water that they hold, they're a really good price um, and a much better deal than 55 gallon drums. And you can get, they make, like you can get them on like Amazon and stuff, these little things that will screw on to the, the outflow of that, that has, that's basically an adapter so that you can screw like a normal garden hose onto those. And those are really nice. There's also a million instructions online to make your own rain barrel. Um, you can even use, I have uh, a trash can that I use sometimes, but I just like sit it under a downspout and it fills up whenever we have rain. And then I put a lid on it when the rain's over and I use it to just like dunk um, a watering can into. Um, if you've got lots of money or you, you know, are real committed to this. Uh, you can also do a cistern, which is like a below ground, um, big water holding tank, um, which are really great if you can get one um, because you can then have water in them all year, which is really nice. They usually hold way more water than like a standard kind of rain barrel, but they are usually quite pricey. Uh, if it is above ground that you're doing this, you are gonna need to winterize your, uh, your rain barrel. Uh, and what that means is you need to empty them before we have freezing weather. Um, you know, a real light frost is probably not gonna be an issue, but before we get into like the cold part of winter, you need to empty them completely of water. And if you don't do this, the freeze thaw cycle can break um, components in the rain barrel. We had a real big rain barrel that that happened with at our demonstration garden a couple of years ago, where, you know, I thought somebody else emptied it. They thought I emptied it. It didn't get emptied. We had a freeze and it just, it, it literally cracked the spigot, like it broke the spigot on the bottom and we had to completely rebuild the whole spigot mechanism, which was, which was a pain. Uh, so then in terms of distribution, so how are you actually getting the water from the rain barrel out? You know, a lot of times people in their head, they're just like, oh, I'll attach a garden hose and I'll do it just the way that I would do from a hydrant. But again, you don't have that pressure. Um, and so, you know, kind of the easiest option is just filling a watering can. Um, it's by far the easiest way to do that. Um, you can use a garden hose. Um, generally, when people use garden hoses, they use it as a way to more easily fill watering cans. Um, so, you know, like if your rain barrel's over there, your garden's over here, you can kind of drag the hose along and kind of fill up your watering can as you're going. Um, the water, again, isn't going to shoot out through a nozzle. Uh, it just kind of pours out. So you can also like water that way. It just usually doesn't work quite um, as well for people. But if that works for you, you can just use the hose and just kind of pour it out onto individual plants. Uh, there are also ways to automate this, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, but uh, you can do gravity fed irrigation from a rain barrel. Uh, so there are special valves that you can get specifically for rain barrels that will allow you to use the rain barrel as a source of water for drip irrigation um, if you want to do that. There's a, there's a school that we work with that has been doing that successfully for many years. Um, but you do need to make sure to get a valve specifically for rain barrels. Otherwise, it won't work. So then uh, different ways to water. So the first you know, obvious one is, is just watering cans. Um, it's a great way to water things. Uh, it, it really is. Uh, it's gentle, which is nice. It's, you get usually a much more gentle flow from a watering can than you do from a hose. Um, and so it's really good um, for newly planted things. Like if you've got especially little seeds, they're not going to like wash away or blast the soil as much. Um, so it can be really good 
um, to get those kind of seeds settled in the ground, like right after you plant. Um, I usually like to use a watering can. Uh, it's, it's the easiest way to utilize rainwater. Um, and if you're gonna buy one, I highly, highly recommend you buy a metal one and not a plastic one. It's well worth the extra money. Um, they last a lot longer, a lot longer. You can also obviously use just a garden hose. Um, garden hoses are great ways to water a lot of things that you don't want to set up a permanent irrigation system for. Um, so, you know, if you've got a big garden, you just need a hose, you want to water it, you know, a hose is, is the best way to do that. Um, if you're going to do the hose, I would highly recommend you get a nozzle of some kind and you don't just have the hose, you know, spraying out big streams of, of water. Um, you want that nozzle to break up the water kind of as much as possible. So, you know, just those normal kind of, um, nozzles that you get for cheap just at a lot of you know hardware stores where you can kind of change it the shower feature is the one that you want um, or if you're looking to buy something spe specifically for watering i would recommend a watering wand like this you can see this woman is using um, it creates a really fine broken up mist um, that's really great for watering um, vegetables especially young seedlings it's a nice light watering um, that's easy to easy to do Sprinklers are also another option that most people, again, are familiar with. Um, these are a great way to water a large area all at once. Um, if you're in a garden, I've seen quite a few people do this, and this is a really great idea, especially when, you're, when your vegetables get tall, is if you set up like a pole, and then you stick the sprinkler on top of the pole, it's then, so then you're above the plants, you can then water that whole area, versus if you're trying to do it on the ground and you've got, you know, four foot tomatoes, it's going to hit those tomatoes and not really water anything anything past that. So if you need to elevate it up on a pole, you can water a larger area and taller plants that way. Um, I, however, do not recommend sprinklers for orchards um, because again, for the most part, you're just gonna be hitting the leaves of the plant, um, which is not helpful and can be, um, and can encourage uh, fungal diseases, which you definitely don't want. So I would not recommend sprinklers for, for orchards, but for vegetable gardens, they can work um, pretty well. Uh, soaker hoses is um, a more automated um, type of irrigation that a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, they're, they're more expensive, but easier to set up than drip irrigation. Um, so so they're, they're pretty popular because of that. Uh, it's, it's essentially just a garden hose that leaks, <laughs> like um, is really all that it is. But that leaking happens under pressure. So um, if, you're, if you just go get a normal garden hose and you hook it up to a rain barrel or a, a normal soaker hose and you hook it up to a rain barrel, it's not gonna work very well. It, it might very slowly drip out water, which might work for you, but you're not gonna see you know, water pouring out like this from a rain barrel for the most part. They do make like low pressure soaker hoses that like will work for rain barrels, but you wanna make sure that if you're buying one and you wanna attach it to a rain barrel that it, um, that it is rated for that, that it's you know saying on there that it will work for that purpose. Uh, with them, basically, you just kind of lay them around your plants, or like if you have a row of plants, you can kind of lay them down the row. Or if you have a big plant, like like a um, like a fruit tree or something, you can kind of wrap wrap a loop or two around kind of the base of the tree so that it's going to water kind of right there um, along the roots. Uh, and then you hook it up to your um, to a rain barrel or you know, the, the faucet on your house um, or a water hydrant, whatever it is, um, and you just turn it on whenever you need water um, or you attach it to a timer, which we'll talk about. Um, and, then, and then you just water it until, until the soil is good. Uh, uh, a bit of warning though, when I have used them, I have found that you usually cannot attach very many in a row. Um, they usually, if, if you do that, you'll get a lot of water coming out in the first hose, but as you go further, down that line, you're not really gonna be getting much water coming out at all. And again, that's because of the pressure drop as you go along the line. So they tend to work for, you know, if you get like a hundred foot soaker hose, you probably just wanna run that hundred that hundred feet. If you hook up 200, like two 100 foot hoses, you're not gonna get an even watering, at least in my experience. Um, so you'll just wanna, wanna be aware of that. Uh, drip irrigation is another one that is becoming um, uh, more readily accessible to kind of the home gardener. But basically what it is, is it's solid plastic tubing, like you see in this picture here, just big long tubes um, that you either insert emitters, like separate things that you buy that you like poke into the tubing that will then let water out. 
or um, they make ones that are usually called drip tape, where it's the tubes that already have kind of emitters in them automatically. Uh, so drip tape is usually easier, but if you're doing like an orchard where the trees are spaced really far apart, usually that's where you'd get the solid tubing and then you'd stick the emitters in individually um, so that you're using less water. But for a vegetable garden, buying like a drip tape, drip irrigation system um, is usually the best. Uh, you'll then need to get like these little connectors to attach tubes together so that you get multiple tubes. Um, if you're, if you're just like a backyard gardener, what I would really recommend if you want to do drip irrigation is to buy a kit. There's lots of kits out there now. Um, they're more expensive than if you like do a completely DIY one. But, um, but if you're just talking about, you know, a couple raised beds or, you know, uh, just a backyard kind of space or even a community garden space, it's probably just not worth the relatively small amount of money you would save to figure out all the different pieces you would need and put it together yourself. But you can definitely do that. And there's lots of great um, uh, information online now about how to do that, videos online about how to do that. But generally speaking, it's, it's this tubing. And again, as a warning, these are all um, pretty much rated so that the emitters run at city water pressure. So if you hook like a normal um, drip tape up to a rain barrel, it might not, it might not work. Some of them, some of them do, they're starting to make kind of more variable ones. Um, but, uh, but sometimes they won't work. So you do just want to kind of check the packaging and see if there's a thing on there that says, you know, works under PSI of 140 or whatever, you know, like just whatever it says um, for that. But drip irrigation is really nice in terms of it, it uh, like I said, it's cheaper than soaker hoses. You're just putting it on the soil and it's just slowly kind of dripping water directly into the soil so it can soak in nice and slow. Um, so it's a really efficient way of using water to irrigate uh, your crops, whether those are trees or vegetables. Um, so if you're looking to like be very water efficient, drip irrigation and soaker hoses are two great ways to do that on kind of a, a, a large scale automated um, system. Um, a note about timers though, for, uh, and you can use this for, you know, sprinklers, drip irrigation or soaker hoses, those last three that we talked about. Um, a, uh, a, the, the way that they work is usually that the timer is going to look something like this, usually some sort of box with knobs on it that you set, you know, when you want it to run. Uh, that hooks directly up to the spigot um, or to kind of the, the nozzle on the outside of, of your home. And then you hook up, uh, you know, the garden hose for a sprinkler or the soaker hose or the tubing connector for the drip irrigation directly to that timer and then you leave your faucet on 24 seven. And then this timer is gonna automatically open or close a valve that will then run this for however long you set it to run and then turn it off whenever you tell it to stop. So you need to make sure to leave this on all the time because if it's not on, the timer isn't gonna do anything. It can't turn that handle, you need to do that. So you wanna leave it on all the time and then the timer will handle the off and on for you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, when the timer, do, 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 okay, I already said that. Um, for most of the of the timers, the valve that like opens and closes is actually done through the water pressure. So there's just like a little computer chip in there that says like, okay, like you can move the little pin or whatever that's holding it closed, and then the water pressure will will open it. Um, if you're running on a rain barrel, those won't work though because there's not enough pressure to open that valve. So it will say like, oh, you can open it. And then it, it just won't open because there's not enough pressure. So that's why if you're gonna do a, a timer for drip irrigation or soaker hose or, well, you can't do it with a sprinkler, but like a soaker hose or a drip irrigation or something, then you wanna get a timer that is specifically saying it is for rain barrels um, because those have a mechanical thing that will open and close the valve um, manually, like the, the or automatically but the, the timer will do that it's not reliant on the pressure so it will automatically open it which will then allow the rainwater to flow into the system and then drip out through drip irrigation or through a soaker hose um, to water those plants for you but again if you just get a normal timer from like Lowe's or Home Depot that is not rated for um, rain barrels it's just not going to work so 
uh, but going into kind of some more like kind of DIY type irrigation, we've got a couple couple that I like here that we'll talk about in the last couple minutes. Um, old bottles is a really easy way to do that. So either glass or plastic ones. Um, wine bottles is one that you see a lot because they have the nice long neck on them. But you can do this with like plastic water bottles or soda bottles or whatever you got. Um, and you just fill them with water and then you just kind of stick them in the ground upside down. And what happens is as the water is taken up by the plant or as it evaporates out of the soil, it opens up pore spaces in the soil, which then allows more water to fall into the soil and kind of soak into the soil. So it's going to kind of slowly water um, the plant as, as needed. So this is usually easiest to do if you're planting like larger individual plants. So in the vegetable garden, that would be, you know, like if you have, you know, tomato plants, which, you know, get pretty big and are spaced pretty far apart, it's pretty easy to like, oh, stick, you know, a bottle or two next to each tomato plant versus like a system like this is much harder to do if you're like, I'm growing lettuce and there's, you know, there's like a million lettuce plants. Like, where do you stick the bottles? How do you, you know, how do you do that? Um, it can be done, but it's a little more difficult. But for like larger plants, like tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, um, you know, even things like cucumbers or pumpkins, you know, where they're kind of sprawling all over, but the roots are kind of, you know, in one, in one area, um, just a plastic or glass bottle is a pretty easy way to irrigate um, surprisingly efficiently. Um, they really use a pretty small amount of water for what they do. Um, and you can do that. Um, they're, they're really nice in containers as well. Like if you're container gardening, they're really nice um, because container gardeners dry, dry out really fast. And so this kind of slow um, automatic watering is, is really helpful to keep them moist, but you can also use it in the ground or in a raised bed. Uh, another system that is really just kind of like, um, I guess, a different way to water really more than anything is a thing called deep pipe irrigation. Um, so this is really good for watering trees or deep rooted vegetables, again, like tomatoes. Um, and all it is, is it's a pipe or some sort of, you know, cylinder thing um, that you kind of pound into the ground. So you can see like in this graphic here, where you are kind of pounding that into the ground and then there's holes drilled into the side of it. Usually there's kind of a cap on the bottom, um, but there doesn't necessarily need to be. And then you pour water into the pipe and then it kind of pours the water out below the soil surface. So this helps to, again, where you're not wetting that top surface. So it helps slow um, water loss to evaporation. It's also, um, uh, nice for things like tomatoes, because since you're watering it down into the soil, you're not really getting the leaves wet at all, which things like tomatoes really don't like their leaves to be wet. Um, there are ones that you can purchase, like there's some pre-made ones, like this is a pre-made one that's, that's a spike, so it's really easy to pound into the ground, and it's got holes on the top, um, which is nice so that you can actually hook up like a drip irrigation system to it, so that it's automatically doing this really deep spike watering. Um, so this is where the tube, you know, comes in and then there, you can buy ones where there's like these separate little um, tubes that come off and then that just goes into this little pipe. And then when the, when the drip irrigation, like when the timer turns on, instead of slowly dripping out of uh, this tube, it's instead pouring water to fill this up and then run it into um, the soil. So this is another system. Uh, this is one that's promoted a lot in, in arid regions of the world, which we're definitely not not arid, um, but it's promoted there because it is um, uh, more efficient than drip irrigation even um, on its own because you're getting it below the soil surface and especially in arid areas where they don't tend to have um, the ability to do as much mulching because there's just not as much plant growth. Um, doing that deeper watering is a great way to conserve um, moisture in those conditions in particular. Um, so this O-L-L-A is pronounced Oya. Um, so Oyas are another, um, another irrigation technique that is actually considered kind of the most efficient irrigation technique that is, that is known. Uh, it's, it was independently developed in a lot of different um, kind of desert, arid areas of the world. Um, and all it is, is it's where you're burying an unglazed clay pot. Um, so, you know, something like this, where you add water to it. And if you've ever had like a terracotta pot and you water the plant, you know that kind of the, the surface, the outside surface of that terracotta pot will get wet because it like slowly kind of bleeds moisture through um, the pot. And you can see that here as it's filling up, it's starting to get wet on the outside, even though the water's coming from the inside. So if you bury that in the soil, it's gonna very slowly kind of leach 
water into the soil. So it's best to, um, to do that again with individual like larger plants is usually the easiest way to use these. And it's where you would bury it and then you would plant those plants kind of in a circle around the Oya. Uh, and then the roots of that plant are actually gonna grow almost like smashed up against that pot and kind of suck the water out as, it, as it's needed. And so it's a very efficient way to water. Purchasing an Oya can be crazy expensive. Like they're, they're really expensive, which is because I mean, they're, their work, you know, I mean, potters, you know, potters and pottery makers, you know, they, they need to make money too. Um, but they can be very expensive to purchase them. So if there's anybody out there who makes pottery, you should make some Oyas um, and sell them. <clears throat> but uh, you can also use like a clay terracotta pot. Um, I've made them before where you get like a terracotta pot, you get the, the saucer. The saucers are actually sized so that if you flip them upside down and put it on the top, they fit perfectly. Um, and you can kind of seal those with like a caulk or something and then flip it upside down and the hole in the bottom of the pot is then the way to add water. Um, and you can bury that. So that's a, usually a cheaper way to make an Oya. Um, but these nice, big, beautiful ones um, you can purchase online. I don't know of a local place that sells them, but you can buy them online, um, but they are pretty pricey. And you can rig up like a drip irrigation system to automatically refill these. So I've seen those, you know, where kind of that same idea as here, um, where you run the tube and you just run it into the top of the Oya um, to refill it. So you're not having to go out there and individually refill those. Uh, and then the last one that I wanna mention is simply a bucket with a hole in it. Uh, so a bucket, like a five gallon bucket or just a large bottle, like a gallon milk jug or something uh, with a hole in the bottom is a great way to water trees and shrubs. Like it is my preferred way to water trees and shrubs. Uh, you want to drill a small hole, like pretty small, like I think like three sixteenths or a quarter inch at most um, in the side toward the bottom, but not all the way at the bottom. Uh, and the reason that you do that is if you put it in the bottom and then you sit it on the ground, it can sometimes get clogged. Um, or if you put it on the side right at the bottom, if there's any dirt or anything that falls in um, to the water, it can again clog that hole. But if you move it up just a little bit, then a lot of that dirt and debris that falls in is going to settle on the bottom and not clog that hole as it drains. And because the hole is pretty small, it's going to come out relatively slowly. So it's going to give plenty of time for the water to soak in. So it's not just that you're like dumping a five gallon bucket and then most of it kind of washes off. So this is a great way um, to do that. And if you're watering your trees, since you're doing just like five gallons once a week, if you have five trees, you, you could just do one bucket. You know, if you don't want to buy five buckets, you could just do one and then one day water this tree and then the next day move that bucket over to the next one and water it and then move it over to there. Um, Cause it is going to take a little bit of time, not a long time, but I don't know, 20, 20 minutes or so to kind of drain that whole, that whole bucket. Um, so it's not probably going to be something where you're going to want to stand out there and wait and then move and then wait and then move. Um, but you could also get, you know, five, five gallon buckets for your five trees and just go and just go from there. So there we go. Um, so that's kind of the basics of, of watering uh, your garden and orchard and some of the, my preferred kind of irrigation techniques um, for that. I'm, there's lots of other things that people um, have done, but those are some of the ones that I have the most experience with and that I can, and that I can speak to as being effective.